he had his gun, so he just swung it open. I start to notice that, you know, the atmosphere feels a little bit weird. First thing he seen was this six and a half foot tall, broad shoulder, dark hair, that freaked him out. We hadn't talked to her about like life and death and what any of that means. She's three years old, you know. So he turned around, suddenly there's a whole tree falling across the road. And she was describing to us that, you know, there was a deceased person uh, that she could she, she could see visually. You're listening to Cryptid Clues, where we tackle the ever-expanding history and mystery of monsters and supernatural madness every Monday. You can find us at cryptidclues.ca for more information, or even check out exclusive content and support us at patreon.com slash cryptidclues. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Cryptid Clues. I am your host, Ruben, joined by your other also host, Taylor. Today, we have a special episode that explores the open wilderness of the western provinces of Canada and how well Bigfoot and other cryptids could take advantage of this very insane landscape. In addition, I have some information I'll be sharing with Taylor regarding certain continental proportions being incorrect in common belief. But before we get into that... Quick plug, our first episode of 2024 is live on our feeds, dropping just last week, and it covers a few Sasquatch encounters, so be sure to check into that. And if you feel bold enough to venture back into 2023, we have a bunch of great episodes that dropped weekly leading up to the new year. But without further ado, let's get into this. Thank you, Ruben. So yes, as you alluded to in the intro, we've got an interesting episode for today, focusing on the the terrain of Western Canada. And I mentioned this to you off the air, but for Christmas, I had taken my family across part of Canada, and as we flew above, we got some very interesting glimpses of the landscape. And it's one thing to view it on Google Maps, but being in the air yourself and looking down, you get some pretty awesome sights. Um, these sights that I'm going to share with you are basically just so you can see for yourself as we discuss the mm -hmm. just the the immense like uh, vastness of, of this this country and so for those of you that are following along uh, you'll be able to see these photos as they'll appear on the YouTube version alternatively you can also check out our website and check out our blog I know I'm very very bad with posting some of our late, latest blogs up there but you'll be able to see one for this episode and I'll have the photos attached so you'll be able to kind of go through and really uh, follow along with us uh, but side note just to get out of the way um, we aren't sponsored or affiliated with WestJet Airlines in any shape or form so disregard the logo on the wing as you view these photos uh, with us because it is uh, completely unaffiliated. So yeah, now that that's been said, I'm going to send these <laughs> that's, photos That's funny to that you mentioned WestJet. Actually, one of my uh, core memories is I was on a plane to Calgary. It was WestJet and we were stuck in that plane for a couple hours because they were having issues. And then they're like, okay, we're good to launch. And they went to launch and then they kicked everyone off the plane because apparently it was unsafe to fly. Oh, and then my gosh. parents had to fight for a refund and we didn't actually get a refund or something. I think they gave us like an extension and we ended up just driving to Calgary instead. Uh, they didn't give you a refund for their own problem? That's horrible. They, they gave us like an extension or another flight or something like that. And my parents uh, said no. I was really little gosh. at the time. So maybe they did, but I don't really recall. I just remember it specifically being WestJet. I mean, usually I prefer WestJet over Air Canada. Um, but I mean, it's to each his own. They're both pretty much the same thing, but that's super shitty. I'm very sorry to hear that. <laughs> oh, it's all good. I'm just saying that to prove we're not being sponsored by them in any way, yeah. shape, or form. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I'm sure um, your photos are going to give them some free advertising. Oh, totally. I mean, I mean, I thought I could just blur the low, the URL out on the wing, but figured no. I mean, when I'm when I'm on the ground and I'm looking up at the planes that are going like thirty thousand feet, I can't see the website listed on the tip of the wing, especially the way they've angled it. But I think they do it because you're looking out the window and you can see that well, that right there. <laughs> why would they put them on the wing of all places? Who's really going to see that? Do you think they were just like struggling to figure out a location to put their logo and URL, and the guy doing it was just like, eh, I'll just wing it. <laughs> Gosh, oh man, that's that's good. I mean, did you? I sent the photos to you. Do you see where it is on the wing? 
it's wait where did you send me the photos hold on oh on, on facebook messenger um oh, okay so, let me open that up right now i'm gonna sorry. be opening this up live here we go here we go oh, folks improv on the spot yeah so some s- improv here as i go to view these photos <laughs> So we'll start. We'll start at the first photo. Uh, and it, holy and photos! I I know. I know. I sent a bunch. So if you scroll back up, you'll see the first one. You can see like the the terrain down below, very woodland. But then you can also see just the, where that logo is. And this is a tangent. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen, but just the tangent. Now this that that logo being right there on the tip of the wing. So that's obviously designed for you're in the plane and you look out the window and you see it as a passenger. If you're on the ground, you're never seeing that URL. Is it to keep you thinking about the company while, like, after you're flying, you take your photos and stuff like that, you share them with people, and they see the URL? It has to be. I mean, like, that, already that's what a, I'm doing now with you. <laughs> you're already a customer. You've already bought from them. So what's the point of putting it on the wingtip otherwise? That's that's interesting. These are some photos, though, like the, the landscape looking through this little portal on the side of the plane, besides the plane wing being smack dab in the center, is this... <laughs> huge landscape that's almost like it's very beautiful the clouds are very low flowing through the mountain tops the sun is nice the the mountain peaks it really just shows how vast canadian well, mountains are that that's exactly it and so for context these photos are flying between british columbia and saskatchewan so we're covering three provinces and and then there's Saskatchewan. It's very very flat. Holy uh, yeah, that you can easily tell which province that we're flying over in that photo. Uh, but it's just it blows my mind how you can see the the difference in the terrain. And I, I we've talked about the provinces before, and we've talked about the Pacific Northwest and Sasquatch sightings and how cryptids are prominently seen in other provinces over others. But just to see it from this perspective, you're either on the top of a mountain, looking out, and you can see everything. You either fly a drone 100 feet up, and you can see valleys, or you're looking on Google Maps, and you're just getting that satellite down imagery, and you can just see, oh, it's just a bunch of pixelated forest. But to be in that perfect uh, perfect margin up above the ground, like 30,000, 40,000 feet in a plane, and you can look down and really see the vastness like this, it's really something else and when you look at that first photo and just the amount of woods it's so devoid of human footprint and it's immaculate it really is just amazing how untouched it is and then when you progress the other photos and you see the the rockies oh my goodness it's just incredible and then you get to that that like oceany oceanic cloud fog that's just swooping over that looks like ground but it's not it's very mystical. It looks like some kind of fantasy land at times. I like to think, though, when you look down at these mountains and all the trees, is the fact that if there is some random creature or cryptid or elusive being hiding there, they don't need to hide very well. They really oh. don't need to hide very well out in the wilderness. They could stand anywhere in these photos. From an aerial view, you'd never see them, obviously, because they're tiny, but you think about it, and the Bigfoot could just hide behind a tree. And oh. one tiny little tree amongst the billions of trees that are down there, it's mind-boggling. Absolutely. And I, I think I, I wrote that in my notes, too. Uh, you can imagine as well that having blankets like this and then you have the tree canopies underneath, thermal imaging, you're going to have a heyday trying to get proper readings, I match. I'm sure they got some pretty powerful thermal imagery, but when you have so many levels to penetrate and then you have a bunch of wildlife already roaming around down there to get accurate readings can be pretty difficult you'd have to probably get a drone and and try and use something closer well even then in something like expedition bigfoot where they're using thermal drones the biggest enemy they have are tree canopies they can't look directly down they have to look into the forest from the side so their drone doesn't help them get up very high. And if they do, they're over top of a lake or something, and they're just looking at the perimeter. They're looking at tree lines. Anything that shows up on a thermal just has to take several steps back, and it's gone. Mm-hmm. So their biggest benefit to the thermal is to make something warm pop and go, oh, something just ran into the tree line there, and then they can go chase it. Or if they do catch something, they can go, well, the thermal looks like it's upright and walking, so let's go investigate over in this area. And that's really the best that a thermal drone can do for you. And tree canopy covering like that yeah absolutely now you alluded to this before so i think the the importance of these photos and seeing the fog and and everything uh, it's that 
can Bigfoot retain the knowledge to navigate when the weather suits them? I don't think it's entirely out of the question, especially if it's true that they will travel miles within that 24 hour period. So let's say that they can tell when a nice fog, like in these photos, kind of descends on the land. Perhaps they would deduce that, hey, this is the ideal travel condition. Humans are not going to be nearby. They're not going to be able to see us flying overhead. So let's let's just capitalize on it. It's kind of like being at home with no parents for the first time. You can just do what you want, so to speak. Maybe that's a bad equivalency, but that's just how I kind of see it because it's just like, hey, Humanity is out of touch. We can go and do what we want right now. I mean, I'd honestly argue the opposite. If Bigfoot's an intelligent being, it's going to realize that the wilderness is devoid of humans, so they don't have to hide. And if there's fog or rain or thunder, something like that, where they can cover their footsteps, their appearance, their sound, they're going to use that kind of weather when people are around to maneuver and get about quickly. Or just stay out of the rain like a, something normal would. Uh, who wants to get wet? So close, yeah, that's true. So closer proximity to human uh, areas, then they're going to wait for the weather to be on their side as opposed to being in like the deep woods, like these photos is what you mean. I would imagine so. This is, of course, assuming the theory that Bigfoot's just an intelligent human species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's that's a fair, fair point. I guess we have to take into account here the, the terrain of these provinces and the sightings, like I mentioned before, British Columbia. It's rich in forest and mountains that only expand as you get closer to the Rockies and Alberta. Of course, Saskatchewan is pretty barren and flat. A plethora of farmland. Uh, something hiding out way over there would be very difficult because it's just flat open. Um, yeah. Well, so. even then, if you look at Saskatchewan in your photos... You could throw anything in those photos and you're not going to see it from up way up high. Like everything yeah, would be tiny true. in comparison. You look at the, this is confusing for the audience since they can't see the photos unless they're on YouTube. But the last photo that Taylor sent me here is just of Saskatchewan. It's very flat. You can see one large building and it's got a little peak of a roof there. And I don't think even a human eye could make out any detail beyond the fact that that is a building. Anything human-sized is invisible. So anything slightly larger than that, you could almost have it standing out in an open field, and all it has to do is maybe lay down if it thinks a plane could see it. That's true. What about in the situation where, again, it's very, very flat, a lot of highways, you're driving along, and you look out, and you could just see it going on and on and on, this flat horizon. That must make it very difficult for things to traverse in that context. And when I was actually speaking with my brother-in-law that lives there, he was talking about how there are small patches of brush, but most of the trees, at least within the city of uh, Regina, for example, they're all planted. Uh, it's basically a, a lot of man-made uh, forested areas. So the ability to hide is lessened there even more so because you're dealing with dealing with not a lot of natural brush. Like I said, if you're driving along a highway, I feel like your odds of seeing someone walking along out there is going to be only heightened because there's just nothing else, right? Well, I think you also have to take into account the fact that in these flat landscapes and highways, you're only going to be seeing humans driving up and down these highways. How often do they see bears? How often do they see packs of deer? I imagine the wildlife is pretty scarce in some of these spaces too because I'm not really seeing any water kicking around or rivers or anything. No, and you're absolutely right. And most of the spots that do have water, these little bodies of water are usually pretty densely occupied with humans or farmers and whatnot surrounding it. So it lowers that chance of uh, wildlife to really kind of engage with it and kind of secretively... I guess hide out or take advantage of a watering hole. So you make a good point with that. I I pieced together the population of the provinces because I thought this would be an interesting note. And it kind of goes hand in hand with as well just how dense the human areas are in comparison to just the sheer volume of valleys and nature and wildlife and forest that's just out there in these provinces. So when you look at British Columbia's population... We have 5.5 million as of 2023. Alberta's population is 4.7 million as of 2023. And Saskatchewan's population is 1.2 million as of 2023. So obviously it scales. 
It's worth noting, too, that most sightings are in the Pacific Northwest. This makes sense, of course, because the higher population will definitely yield more frequent sightings. But also remember that aside from a few northern cities, most of the population of British Columbia, for example, is along our friends to the south, that our border. The city of Vancouver... Oh, sorry. What were you going to say? Uh, carry on. Finish, finish this note off. I do have something to say after that's quite intriguing, though. Okay. Uh, the city of Vancouver alone has over 2.6 million people as of 2023. Holy fudge. <laughs> that's almost half of the province's total population condensed in that, like, just huge, huge humanized area. So Bigfoot is definitely staying away from Vancouver, I'm going to say. But you do have the outskirts that are prominent sightings with with Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Something to consider, too, is despite the human population being so massive, if you were to provide enough space for only a person to spin around with their arms extended, the entire human population, supposedly, according to mathematics, could fit in Hawaii. The entire human population. Really? Within 10,430 kilometers squared, you could fit every single human being on the planet if you were to pack them all together. Now, no one would be able to live because you could only spin around. Mm -hmm. But that really puts it into perspective if you look at a world map of how not overpopulated we really are. Yeah. Considering we live in a world where they, I shouldn't say they, uh, it's an implication that we are overpopulated. Uh, it just feels like there's a heavy weight of overpopulation on everyone's shoulders, I guess you could say. But that's something that I feel is just kind of my own biased perspective. <laughs> and same for the record, but carrying on from that, it's just an interesting statistic that you can shove everyone into such a small area unhumanely and kind of look at it as a, in the bigger picture of how huge our planet really is. Yeah, that just I'm flabbergasted about that. That, I, that blows my mind, but it it just goes to show too just those really small areas that are just so densely populated and just just I mean a, a, a Hawaii aside, people are just building up up up. And you can fit so many more people in densely uh, packed uh, situations, I guess you could say, and living accommodations. Well, and to say that human beings being densely packed in an area would maybe scare away a cryptid, there's still Bigfoot sightings and reports that come out of Vancouver Island. Yes, absolutely. And Vancouver Island is definitely no... It's no shortage of being lack there of forest, I think I've said this on previous episodes, but Mount Benson, for example, it's a huge mountain on Vancouver Island, just kind of like a few minutes outside of Nanaimo. And I've hiked it a few times. And so when you get to the top, you can see open ocean, Nanaimo Harbor, and it just, it, out in the distance, you can make out the faint silhouette of the mainland in Vancouver. And if you looked to your backside, you'd think, okay, this is an island. You're going to see the ocean way out there as well. You turn around, no, you aren't seeing any ocean. It is just mountain ranges upon mountain ranges, forest upon forest going out there. And I remember being at a few shows, or not shows, but uh, I guess small conferences and presentations where people were talking about Sasquatch. And a gentleman came forward, and I know I definitely told you about this before. He was talking about going up old logging roads and, and actually seeing huge tracks and, and Sasquatch basically being way, way, way out there, mile, like a few miles off of these old logging roads. And Vancouver Island is a lot of back trails and off-roads that you can take advantage of and indulge in, as well as a lot of cave systems, too, that you can explore, which I've talked about. Which reminds me, when you look at these photos and you see the Rockies and you see all of these massive, massive mountains, the, one of the first things that popped into my head as I saw them was like, oh my goodness, what are the odds of there being underground tunnels and huge underground highways that are just crevices and columns that could be accessed underneath here? I mean, if, again, we talked about how if it's out in the middle of nowhere like it is, a Bigfoot might be more calm and relaxed and thinking no one's going to see me. I can just stick to above ground. But then again, who's to say that there aren't ways to just travel underground as well through highways yeah. in the Rockies. 
And there's always the case that we could be incorrect with our theories and the whole quantum Bigfoot idea could be the case or spiritual mm -hmm. in some sense too. And then we don't have to worry about either above ground or below ground or why a Bigfoot would be on the Vancouver Islands, which is so densely packed. Like it could just appear anywhere if it's that, if that's the case. That's absolutely true. Lately, I get a small, small side note before I pass, pass it over to you. I feel like just the term quantum mechanics and quantum science has just been popping up. And I don't know if it's because I'm, I'm more familiar with it and I'm just kind of noticing the term appear, but it just it seems to be popping up every now and again in my life. I'm thinking this is interesting how it's kind of just being a little bit more prominent. It makes me happy actually, because I feel like it's something that needs to have more discussion behind it. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And Honestly, when it comes to this episode, the whole idea behind it really brings me to a point on how massive the wilderness is in other parts of the world. And I mean, if you think, if you truly think that North America has a massive amount of unexplored land, like look at you just flying over in the airplane taking these photos that show how massive that landscape is, it's mind boggling. And I'm going to use that word again. I know I've said it like twice this episode already. It's mind boggling. When you think about the rest of the globe in comparison to how we make our maps. So first of all, we've been using something called the Mercator map since the 1970s. This is the map that is used on most globes or in schools. It's what you're shown in your textbooks. And there's actually a disparity between the imagery that you're shown in schools versus what the text correlates to. So when they show you the kilometers and the distance squared for a continent, if you take one look at the imagery that's in your textbook, it doesn't line up. So they're not teaching you the wrong thing, but they're definitely showing you this outdated map still. So for the viewer's sake here, I have a little file in my notes that Taylor's going to be looking at here, and it's a picture of the world map in dark blue and light blue. Light blue showing the Mercator map and dark blue showing the actual size of the map of all the different continents. And maybe that's something he can put on the blog or show in the video briefly here so you can kind of view it with us. But when you look at the Mercator map, Canada and Russia take up about 25% of the Earth's surface, which is, that's a full one fourth. That's a quarter of the entire globe. But in reality, they actually only take up 5% according their, to their kilometers squared. Greenland is a great example. It's inflated to four and a half times the size to the point where if you were to take Greenland off this map, on the Mercator map that you can find everywhere, and just rotate it and slap it on top of Canada, it would swallow Canada. But Canada is 9 million kilometers squared. Greenland is only 2 million kilometers squared. So as soon as you do that with this picture, the kilometers don't make any sense. And obviously the kilometers are what we've measured. Those are the correct sizes. So you can look at any common map and tell me Greenland looks any bit smaller. It doesn't. But in reality, it's tiny compared to Canada. So the increase in size on the Mercator's map inflates the Northern European and American continents to appear larger than the rest of the world, when in fact the Southern continents are actually much larger than all the rest. And this isn't a conspiracy, this is just fact. This is commonly accepted knowledge. It's just that people don't commonly learn it. The increase in size is so out there that at first you'd assume that maybe Canada to be larger than Australia, but in actuality, Australia is pretty big. Australia is the same size as Canada. You can fit Europe from Spain to Ukraine inside of Australia to show how small Europe is. And when you think of Spain to Ukraine, you think of all that stuff over there in Italy. In my mind, I'm thinking, well, that's a huge part of the world, but it's actually really small. You can fit all of Canada and America at their true scale inside of South Africa with plenty of room to spare. So just to really drive my point home here, if you think the wilderness out here is large enough to host undiscovered creatures and cryptids in North America, in Canada alone, in BC and Saskatchewan, in these tiny little places that we've barely seen or explored, what about the rest of the world? When South Africa, when even Europe, as small as it is in reality, these places are so intensely huge and unexplored, we can't even begin to fathom how 
vast the wilderness is. And we think that we've seen so much out there, but really we've mapped the world. We've seen it through airplanes, but we haven't actually set boots to the ground and dug through the entire forest because our, I was, I was going to say densely packed human population, our undensely packed human population, when it's spread out, isn't enough to look at every single square inch of the earth. You can't explore it. You can only explore random little pieces of it. And I think it's just the fact that we're taught in schools using these images to showing this incorrect scale that kind of dumbs down this information. When people think of Bigfoot or they think of cryptids or they think of something like that, well, your first thought is to go to how you think the world looks. You think of how well it's explored. That's not the truth. It's something off the wacky train. Why haven't we made an effort to fix this? Is it so that our countries feel superior to other countries so that the northern half of the globe where we happen to be situated appears superior to the rest? And actually, in the 1980s, you know, the Gal Peters projection map was made, and that was to make an accurate representation of the Earth. But in comparison, it looks like a poorly stretched image in Photoshop. Nobody liked it. So nobody used it. Schools didn't really adopt it because the 1970s map looks nicer. So how did you first learn about this? Because as you said, it's it's fact. You can look this up yourself. And just the idea of this being so easily available for people, I feel like it's something that is so easily missed. So did someone point this out to you or did you just happen to figure it out? I didn't know it. And then I was just browsing social media and the internet one day and somebody else had posted it and I Googled it. And I looked into it. Did you know that Google Maps actually made an effort to fix this? If you zoom out in their globe projection, they have much more accurate continent sizes than you would think. That I did not know. And I, f I feel like it's quite humorous how it's kind of like a low-key remedy that we're trying to <laughs> rectify after all this time. But you made a very interesting point how... Uh, why why wasn't this fixed so much so much sooner is it because like oh it was a country superiority complex i think that that is very much a plausible notion because you're dealing with archaic mindsets a few hundred years ago and these regimes that really wanted to flamboyantly flaunt their empires and how their their positions of power and i i think that that representation and a lot of other archaic things were are still very prominently funneled down into our, our education systems and, and other sorts of um, learning mechanisms in society. Because, I mean, let's face it, when I was in school, I remember getting these freaking old textbooks. These things were at least 20 to 30 years old, and they were drawn all over the bloody things. And the information was very, very outdated. I, I really would wonder what the textbooks are of today's age in schools. Um, and again, I'm not, not bashing the school system. I just think that the schools these days, they don't get the proper funding to upgrade their, their, their books and their, their own like tools to, to teach and instruct with. And I, I just think that's kind of a, an Achilles heel in our own, our own civilization to inhibit proper education. Like, in the context of this, the proper size of the world to the next generation moving forward. It just seems kind of weird and backwards. It's very subtle too. Like I said, the correct proportions are taught in the text, but the imagery is what sticks in your mind. Absolutely. I'm a visual learner. And so the imagery absolutely takes that, uh, that, that dominating sense in my mind. And when you look at Russia, that is a great example where you see Russia is just a huge superpower and it's, oh, Russia is the biggest country in the world, right? Well, it's it's definitely huge, but when you stack that as a continent and compare it up with other continents, like you said, Africa and South America, I mean, those southern continents are huge. like, And they're only huge because they're, they're accuracy-wise in this first uh, Mercator scale that you provided here it just shows that they're pretty much accurate but it's those northern ones that are just yeah they're just off the off the rocker <laughs> yeah well is there anything else you wanted to cap in there because i i think it's just 
in short for me, I don't I have a couple other things I'll say, but I think that's pretty much it. I mean, we we opened up this episode to talk about just how vast the wilderness really is and possibilities and stuff of cryptids or creatures being out there. And we've talked about it before in previous episodes, but it kind of feels like when we put it into perspective, it's myth busted. Like, yeah, there's, there's, there could be things out there very easily. There's no doubt in my mind. And if anyone with an open mind can't see that, well, you don't really have an open mind. If you have a closed mind and you have your belief, that's a different matter and that's fine. But it's just too big. You have to account for the unknown. And when you look at maps like this and you think it's just that flat perspective, sure, there's that that flat earthly perspective, left, right, two-dimensional, however you want to put it. But uh, when you also look into an account for the fact that, hey, there's up and down. And a lot of cryptids, at least how I see it, can take advantage of that. They can be underground. They can be up above us. We don't even know. And so it just adds more evasion. It adds more expansion. It adds a lot more depth to the world that we haven't explored yet. We haven't explored every cave. We haven't explored every cavern. We haven't explored everything up in the sky. There's a lot of things, I'm sure, up there that's that's going on that would be very interesting to see. So... It just remains to be seen that there's there's uh, just an, a mysterious world that still needs to be discovered out there. You reminded me, though, if these northern continents are much smaller than they would appear otherwise, uh, that would it mean that there's a lot more ocean, correct? Well, not really. Because when you look at the Mercator map, you have to account for a globe in this sense and when you squish it down and you fit all the continents kind of together i have a second image that i posted for just for the viewers sake here and you can show that in the video as well of that gross looking picture of the world looking stretched that's more proper to scale and if you wrap that around a circle it's going to be more accurate the ocean size doesn't really change all that much even though the continents are inflated it's kind of like you're taking a squished image you're grabbing the top left and the top right corners and you're skewing that perspective towards you so now you're shrinking the bottom portion of it if that makes sense and i mean we just talked about the wilderness and cryptids and stuff but you brought up oceans and now i'm thinking of all the vast undiscovered ocean horrors well absolutely that, as I said, with, with the land masses, there's up, there's down, and so many different areas that we haven't explored. The oceans are just easily another huge example of that. And it's not just, hey, you're in the water and you're going left and right and just kind of swimming around to find different things and discover different things. But you have to think you're dealing with trenches and you're dealing with um, hugely like underground chasms with, hey, maybe oceans underneath our oceans. It just goes on and on. But that's a topic for another day. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Well, I think that's all for now. Taylor, do you want to take us away? Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Cryptid Clues. You can find us on our website where this imagery will all be included from this episode in our blog. If you can follow on the YouTube, then you're all set there because the photos have been appearing as we've been discussing about them. Cryptidclues.ca is where that blog is accessible. You can find us on our social media channels, X, which is Twitter and uh, YouTube and Facebook and all that fun stuff. We're on Patreon. And if you want to send us an email and reach out, you can cryptoclues at gmail.com. Um, and that should do it. Yeah. So until next time, <laughs> take care and stay safe. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>